True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. It's one of the biggest bank heists in South African history. The police are sure a gang of professionals is at work, and they brace themselves for more robberies. They scour their underground informants for information on this new organized crime gang, but no one seems to know anything about these genius bank robbers. And that's because, well, the truth is very different. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and this is Episode 77, The Great Trust Bank Robbery. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Talita Berger, Marlene Scott, Chelsea Tucker, Maxine, Helen Georgiakis, Claire Satchwell, Sue-Ann Rankana, Gerda Fari, Tanith McKenzie, Lindy Lee Vandenberg, Renal, Renee Swart, and Mabel Stradorm for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs or Print Crowd for all your printing requirements and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for a 10% discount and support the show at the same time. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use to listen. True Crime South Africa is of course my main podcast baby, but I've also hosted the Devil's Door Companion podcast, and in 2022 you could possibly see some more podcasts popping into your feed from me. You can also follow my Facebook page to get updates on those new projects. As you'll have gathered from the episode title, today's episode is a little different from the cases I usually cover. I think we've had quite a few really tough episodes to listen to recently, so I thought something a little lighter would be a nice break, for you as well as me. To be honest, The title of the episode is a little misleading, but that's what the crime has always been referred to as. Really, the crime in question was less than impressive in its complexity, but it would certainly go down in history for a number of other reasons. Resources for this episode include the book Famous South African Crimes by Rob Marsh and several media articles. So let's get into... Episode 77, The Great Trust Bank Robbery. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. In 1968, Derek Whitehead and Willem van der Merwe two friends in their thirties, had started a house painting business together. For the first year, the business went pretty well, but in 1970, things took a turn, and the men were no longer even making enough money to cover their own expenses. It was around this time that the friends decided the best plan of action would be for them both to sell their houses in Johannesburg and combine their funds to build holiday cottages on the garden route. In early 1971, Derek and Willem decided to take a trip to Neisner to look at the available land there. As they drove the popular tourist route and passed through small town after small town, the men started to joke about how easy it would be to break into one of the banks in these small towns. During the week, and at month's end they were busy enough, 
But out of season, and later in the afternoon, there was simply no one around. Add to that the fact that most of these small towns didn't have their own police stations, and it sort of made for the perfect crime, the men joked. Well, at least in the first town, it was a joke. But by the third, fourth and fifth towns, Willem and Derek were less amused by the idea of becoming bank robbers and more seriously considering it. After all, they thought, the money was insured. It wasn't like they would be stealing from actual people. Of course, the idea that bank robbery is a victimless crime is not correct. If the bank is robbed while it's open and people are in the bank, the victims are clear. The employees and customers are terrorized, sometimes assaulted. But even if a bank is broken into after hours and the money is stolen when no one is there, there are still eventual victims. When a bank has money stolen from them, even though their insurance will likely cover the lost cash, the bank's risk profile increases and their insurance premiums increase. As a result, their expenses go up and they have to make that money up somewhere so they increase fees to their customers. If the loss is significant enough, the branch may even close or have to let staff go. So, no, bank robbery is not a victimless crime, even if there's no violence involved. But as Willem and Derek drove, and considered the possibility of solving all their financial woes in one fell swoop, they weren't thinking about that. By the time the friends had made it to Neisner, checked out the land they wanted to buy, and driven back to Johannesburg, their plans were firmly cemented in their minds. In March 1971, they began to buy cutting tools they intended to use to break through safes and bars they might find in the bank. They also brought a third man into their newly formed gang, Gilbert Mtembu. Their first target was the Folkscust Bank in Uniondale in the Western Cape. Now, if you were not yet born in or have no memories of the 70s, and you're wondering about the weird bank names I'm mentioning, many of these banks changed names, or merged together, and became the banks we know today. Some of them ceased to exist entirely, but that would certainly have nothing to do with the trio's initial attempt at bank robbery. On their arrival at the Folkscus Bank in Uniondale, around dawn, the three smashed a window at the back of the bank and made their way inside the building. As the three men stood, closer to robbing a bank than they'd ever been, one of them suggested that maybe they hadn't picked the best time of day. The locals would be up and about relatively soon, and they became concerned they'd get caught. This possibility was enough to spook all three, and they fled the building. The men hid out in Neisner for a few days. They wanted to make another attempt, but weren't able to pluck up the courage. So instead, they decided to return to Johannesburg. Along the way, though, their bravery levels suddenly surged, and they stopped in Aberdeen in the Eastern Cape. Scoping out a Folkscus branch there, the trio decided to give it a try. Derek stood watch out front, while Willem and Gilbert went round back to attempt to gain access. Again, the men smashed a window to enter, and this time they made it all the way to the safe. But they were back at the car with Derek within 15 minutes, and empty-handed. The safe, it turned out, was made of carbon steel, and they'd made no headway in getting into it with their cutting torches. The three returned to Johannesburg without the loot they'd come for, and upon their return, their financial struggles only worsened. Both Willem and Derek's vehicles were repossessed by the bank, and they decided to permanently close their business as they had suppliers banging on the door for payment. Ironically, when Willem van der Merwe was seated in a trust bank in Johannesburg CBD 
attempting to stall the repossession of his car, a new idea dawned on him. As he spoke to the bank manager through the large plate glass windows, he saw a security van pull up to make a cash delivery to the bank. As the bank manager droned on and on about how he had no choice but to take back Willem's vehicle, the man watched as the security van personnel left their vehicle unattended outside the bank for a full 15 minutes. For a few days after that, Willem followed the security van to get an idea of its usual route and schedule. He noticed that the van would first stop at the reserve bank to load up with cash, and then head straight to the Johannesburg CBD Trust Bank he'd seen it at, before continuing on deliveries to other banks. After informing his partners in hopeful crime of his new plan, the men realised that the only thing standing in their way was access to the keys for the vehicle. The driver of the van, despite leaving his very valuable cargo abandoned for 15 minutes at a time, did do his due diligence of locking the vehicle each time he left it. The men did not want to have to tangle with the security guard to get his keys. The ideal situation, they decided, would be if they could somehow find a duplicate key and just get in and drive away while the guards were inside the bank. The men thought that if they could make the van break down and then follow it when it was taken to a garage to be repaired, they could find an opportunity to take the van's keys and make copies. On the 25th of April 1971, the men located where the van was parked at night and poured two pints of oil into the petrol tank. The next day they followed the van, waiting for it to break down, but the oil didn't seem to have any impact. That night, they added some water to the petrol tank instead. This did the trick, and when the van broke down and was towed to the closest garage, the trio followed it. At first, they attempted to use putty to make impressions of the keys while one of the men posed as a client and distracted the staff. When this didn't work, they decided to steal the keys while the mechanics worked on the vehicle and make copies. Of course, this is way before car keys had chips and all sorts of electronics in them, and you had to remortgage your house to afford a new key if you lost yours and didn't have a spare. In the early 1970s, car keys were basically like any other plain metal key, and if you went to the right locksmith, they'd have no problem making you a copy. And this is just what the men managed to do, before returning the keys to the garage before anyone suspected a thing. Up to this point in the plan, none of the men had told anyone else what they were up to. Their secret intentions had remained among the three. But after they managed to get the security van's keys, Derek Whitehead decided to tell his wife Jeanette about their plan. The reason he did this is that he needed an extra vehicle for them to get away if the security van was intercepted. When Jeanette discovered what her husband had in mind, the couple had a huge argument, but the woman eventually agreed to follow the security van in her car. Jeanette's role in the crime was to stay nearby in case something went wrong and they needed a getaway car. On Tuesday the 27th of April 1971, the plan was executed. The men had hired a VW Combi to use in the crime so that they'd have enough space to carry their haul. They also arranged fake number plates for both the Combi and Jeanette's car. Derek drove the Combi that morning while Willem followed with Jeanette in her car. That morning, though, the odds were not in the group's favour as the security guard spent a very short period outside the bank before leaving again. Before they could lose their nerve, they tried again the next morning, and this time, the plan went off without a hitch. Jeanette delivered Willem to the street outside the bank, and as soon as the security guards had been inside for about five minutes, he strolled up to the security van, used the key they'd cut, 
unlocked the door, started the van, and drove away, while Jeanette followed in her vehicle to an open piece of ground just a few blocks from the bank, where Derek was waiting in the combi. There, the men transferred the boxes of money from the security van to their vehicle. But someone was watching. An employee at a nearby warehouse was standing outside his workplace when he saw the exchange taking place. The man immediately became suspicious, but didn't call police. He did get a good look at Jeanette, though, and was able to describe and identify her later. With the money exchange complete, the group abandoned the security van and drove to Parktown, where they transferred the money into Willem's car, and then abandoned their rental combi. Later that night, the men drove to the Val River and dumped the metal boxes that the money had been in. Derek packed the wads of cash into the ceiling of his caravan, hitched it to his wife's car, and set off for Neisner with his wife and four children. The family arrived in Neisner on the 1st of May and booked into the Brenton-on-Lake Hotel. Three days later, Willem arrived with his wife, Marlene. It was only around this time that the two men actually counted their loot. They'd managed to steal 240,000 rand. At the time, it was the second largest theft of its kind in South African history. According to the website inflationtool.com, that would be the equivalence of 12 million rand in today's money. After reuniting, the couples then once again split up, with the Whiteheads moving to a nearby resort and the Fundamavas moving to a hotel. On the 9th of May, the Fundamavas left Neisner for Bloemfontein to visit Willem's parents-in-law. The 70s in Joburg CBD didn't provide much major crime for police in that jurisdiction, so news of a security van theft soon blew through the entire area, and every available policeman was on the case. Looking at the way the crime had been carried out, the ease with which the perpetrators just drove away with the van, and then seemingly disappeared into thin air, police were convinced that they were dealing with a very sophisticated gang of criminals. The fact that the gang had clearly had access to duplicate keys for the vehicle, had police believing that they were dealing with an inside job. So a significant amount of time was spent interrogating staff from the bank and the security company to figure out who was involved. Soon, though, police realized that they were on the trail of an unintentional red herring, and they were unable to pinpoint a single employee that may have been involved in the heist. So, they opened the scope to include anyone who may have had contact with the van or its driver at any time. It would take two weeks for the connection to be made between the van's breakdown and the duplication of the keys. Employees at the garage then vaguely remembered two men who'd been hanging about on the day the security van was in their shop. After scoping out locksmiths around the garage, they were able to identify Willem van der Merwe as a man who'd brought a vehicle key in for cutting on the day the van was in the garage. Police went to van der Merwe's house, but there was no one home, and neighbours told the officers that the family had gone to Bloemfontein to visit his in-laws. After the warehouse employee came forward and reported seeing a Mercedes-Benz around the security van in the field when the money transfer was taking place, police were able to connect the Whiteheads to the crime too, and they knew that they were on to something. When they looked into the business affairs of Whitehead and Fundamava and saw how much debt they were in, the motive became clear. On the 10th of May, Police put out an alert for Jeanette's Mercedes-Benz in Bloemfontein. Police had assumed the men may have stayed together, and perhaps the Whiteheads would also be in Bloemfontein. Included in the alert were photographs of Willem, Derek and Jeanette. Three days later, 
Willem van der Merwe was spotted driving through a roadblock in Bloemfontein. Police tailed the man to a house he was staying at and arrested him. It didn't take long for him to provide a full confession and tell police where the whiteheads were hiding. Police alerted their colleagues in Neisner, and that evening a van pulled up next to the Whitehead's campsite. The caravan was there, but the family was not. It wouldn't take long for police to track them down, though, while Neisner police continued to guard the caravan, which, according to Van Merva, held at least part of the loot. At 3am the next morning, the Whiteheads were arrested at the Little Switzerland Resort in the Drakensberg. Their children were taken into foster care, while the parents were separated to stop them from colluding on their versions. The team that made the arrest that day consisted of officers from three different provinces. The couple were taken to Bloemfontein for questioning, and then Jeanette was taken to Johannesburg, where she appeared in court and was then detained in jail. Meanwhile, two army helicopters flew Derek Whitehead, Willem van der Merwe, and 12 detectives to the Neisner campsite. The men unlocked the caravan and showed police where the money was hidden. Just 1,538 rand had been used. The rest remained in the ceiling of the caravan. Now, it kind of blows my mind a little that Derek Whitehead left his caravan, which, thanks to its contents, was worth 240,000 rand, just parked in Neisner, while he and his family flitted off to the Drakensberg. Perhaps it's a sign of the times, that he didn't think for a moment it would be broken into or stolen. Derek and Willem were denied bail, and kept in custody pending their trial. Jeanette Whitehead was granted bail of 1,000 rand on the basis that she had four children to care for. The trial began in June 1971, and all three pleaded guilty to having stolen the 240,000 rand. After two days of hearing mitigating and aggravating circumstances, the judge decided to suspend sentencing of Jeanette Whitehead for three years. Essentially, If Jeanette did not commit any further crimes in the next three years, she would not be punished for her role in the robbery. He did this in order to allow her children the opportunity to reach an age where they would find separation from their mother less traumatic, and Jeanette was released. In passing down this decision, the judge said, No doubt my leniency in this regard will be criticised but I am prepared to face such critics. My tender feelings for her young children have persuaded me to deal with Mrs. Whitehead as leniently as possible. End quote. The judge also accepted Jeanette's claims that she had only participated because she feared for her husband's safety if she didn't. The judge then moved on to Willem and Derek, whose actions he described as cold, calculated and ingenious. He said it was very clear that the men had been planning the crime for a long time and therefore had more than enough opportunity to halt their plans and choose not to commit the crime. The judge then said that he was concerned that if he passed down a light sentence that other members of the public might see it as an opportunity to commit similar crimes considering so many holes in the banking and money transport system had been exposed by the men's robbery. Those attending the sentencing gasped as the judge handed down 14 years' imprisonment to each man. Although Gilbert Ntembu had not been involved in the main robbery, he was arrested in connection with his involvement in the other attempted robberies and the planning of the main crime. The attempted robberies were to be dealt with as a separate trial from the main crime. In September 1971, both Willem and Derek appealed their sentences and the term was reduced on appeal to 10 years each. In that same month, the two men, along with Gilbert and Tembu, stood trial in Graaf Renit for the two attempted robberies in that region. 
All three men were handed down one-year prison sentences. Derek Whitehead and Willem van der Merwe would only end up serving four years in prison before they were released in June 1975. If they're alive today, they will both be in their 80s. The resort in the Drakensberg at which Derek Whitehead was arrested named its ladies' bar the Robber's Roost after one of its most infamous guests, who didn't actually even get to stay the night. This crime was essentially one of South Africa's first cash-in-transit heists. Today, of course, such heists have become far more deadly and violent, and a lot of the extra security around banks and the transportation of money would start being implemented in the 1970s. Today, a van carrying cash is guarded at all times by people with very large guns. And I don't know about you, but I usually make a very wide berth around any cash-in-transit van. And this is pretty much all where it started, with two house painters who walked up to a van, got in, and drove away. Really, although these guys weren't professional criminals, for the novices that they were, they didn't do a bad job of covering their tracks. But the devil's in the details, and it would be those small things, like using their own vehicle and going to a locksmith close to the garage to cut the key, that resulted in them being identified. Of course, the men would not be the last of the infamous South African bank robbers. In episode 49, I covered the infamous Stunder Gang, and how the legend that was formed around the leader of that gang masked a very dark reality. The Stunder Gang hit South Africa five years after the Great Trust Bank robbery. In 1977, a robbery in Krugersdorp made the headlines when a gang of thieves tunnelled into the Standard Bank there over Easter weekend and got away with 400,000 rand. That case remains unsolved to this day. And then in the 1980s, another bank robber would become the reason why motorbike helmets were banned from banks. Dave Fulyun would eventually be sentenced to 128 years in prison for robbing several branches of the United Building Society. His trademark disguise was the motorbike helmet he wore into banks, which masked his face and prevented him from being identified for quite some time. The man's love of gold jewellery and teeth cappings, though, would eventually give him away when he insisted on pairing his helmet with multiple gold bracelets, rings and necklaces, which tipped off someone who knew him. Although the occasional bank robbery still happens today, as security has improved and more people are banking digitally, cash-in-transit heists have definitely become more prevalent than bank robberies. I always find it quite interesting how, as we saw with the Stunder Gang, criminals whose crimes seem cleverly executed and who don't commit violent crimes often become legendary, especially when they seem to be committing Robin Hood-type crimes, where, as I referenced in the beginning of the show, the only victim seems to be a big institution. The truth is, though, that there are no victimless crimes. Although the concept is different if we approach it from a societal aspect or from a legal aspect, in some parts of the world, legally defined victimless crimes include possession of any legal contraband, recreational drug use, sex work, prohibited sexual behavior between consenting adults, assisted suicide, and smuggling. In South Africa, counterfeiting is illegal, of course, But from much of the public's perspective, it's very much seen as a victimless crime. When people purchase counterfeit goods, they're not looking the victim in the eye. So it certainly seems like no one's getting hurt. They're paying for something, and that's the end of it. But the economic ramifications for the brand that's being counterfeited, as well as the employees of the brand, are significant. 
pirating of e-books is another thing that South Africans seem to think is a victimless crime. People so often share PDF copies of e-books, with their reasoning being, well, I paid for it, so why can't I share it? Well, that's because every time you share that book with someone, you're literally stealing money out of the author's pocket. Writers sometimes spend years writing their book, and the only reward they get is a royalty off a book sale. And in case you're thinking, well, it's the same as passing around a paperback copy. No, it's really not. A paperback copy might see 10 or 15 pairs of eyes in its lifetime, if it gets passed around. A digital copy can be distributed to thousands of people in one email. Do you know how much money that author is losing through that? Victimless crimes may, in some ways, be a matter of perspective, of course. But just like Willem and Derek, if something seems too much of an easy way to make money or get what you want, maybe it's time to ask who's actually losing out here. Because there's almost always someone even if that victim doesn't have a face that you can look at or a name that you can say. Hold your horses, it's too cold to reface Expressions that mean nothing Thank you for listening to episode 77, The Great, or Not So Great, Trust Bank Robbery. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>